This lecture is part of the West Indian Soldier Heritage Project, carried out in partnership with the National Army Museum and the National Lottery Heritage Fund. The Western Design, the conquest of Jamaica by the English Army in 1655. In this lecture, we look at one of the pivotal moments of the history of the Caribbean, one that would have a great effect not only on the Caribbean, but Britain for centuries to come. The story of the Western design begins during the Interregnum, the period following the execution of Charles I in 1649 until the restoration of Charles II to the throne in 1660. Following the dissolution of the so-called Parliament of the Saints in 1653, Oliver Cromwell ruled as Lord Protector of the Commonwealth, comprising England, Wales, Scotland and Ireland. Having secured the government, Cromwell and his ministers turned their mind to foreign policy in 1654. In the Americas, the vast majority of the New World was still under Spanish control following the voyage of Columbus and the claim that they subsequently made on the entire region. However, other European nations, including England, were also beginning to establish their own colonies in the region in defiance of the Spanish. In the case of the English, by this time, it included Barbados, St. Kitts, Nevis, Anguilla and others. Cromwell and his government decided that they wished to challenge the power of Spain, at that time the mightiest of European nations thanks to its large empire. To that end, a great expedition was envisaged, one that would send a military force to the New World and seize the Spanish colonies in the Caribbean and on the Central American coast by force. One of the great questions for historians was what is the exact motivation for such an undertaking? Some point to purely economic motives, wishing to seize a piece of the profitable new world for England, or at least to deprive the Spanish of such an advantage. Others argue that the purpose was to protect English trading vessels operating in the region, which were frequently attacked by the Spanish on the grounds that they were violating what the Spanish viewed as their exclusive sphere of influence. Cromwell had previously asked Spain to give up their monopoly on the region and was refused. Others point to a religious motive. Religious fervour was rife in 17th century England, with the matter of Protestantism versus Catholicism playing a role in many momentous events throughout the century, including the English Civil War itself. There was a very strong element of Puritan Protestantism in the governance of Cromwell's protectorate, and to that end, amongst many, there was a strong feeling that an expedition against Catholic Spain was sanctioned by God. An eyewitness account of the expedition in the West India Committee collection speaks of going against idolaters, heretics and the false church. There was also the matter of the dreaded Spanish Inquisition, which Cromwell had also requested in vain that Spain no longer subject English merchants to. In truth, however, the reasoning behind the expedition is likely to have been a mixture of all these different elements. This expedition was a significant undertaking which required great planning. A sizable army was required for the task, but it was decided that new units would be formed instead of using existing corps. To that end, the regiments of Cromwell's army stationed in England were asked for volunteers. These were, for the most part, not particularly forthcoming, and so regimental commanders took it upon themselves to volunteer men for service. These men tended to be the ones that the commanders wished to get rid of, those men who proved to be undisciplined or lacking in skill. The commanders of the expedition later complained that they had not been allowed to recruit from the regiments stationed in Ireland, who were more experienced and combat ready. When this initial phase of recruitment failed to produce enough men, press gangs were employed in London, where many refugees had fled in light of the political and economic turmoil that had gripped the England for years by this point. However, this also failed to produce the number of men required, and it was decided that further recruitment to make up the number would be carried out when the expedition arrived in the West Indies. The secrecy with which the preparations were made, recruiting the men, securing supplies and ammunition, was thorough. It was this secrecy that gave rise to the nebulous name of the Western Design. The commanders were two of Cromwell's most experienced officers, the Army's General Robert Venables, and General at Sea, also known as Admiral William Penn. 
The expedition would also be overseen by commissioners appointed by the government, who would take command and organise the new territories that it was intended to conquer. However, it was not made clear who was to be in overall command of the expedition, which later led to tensions which affected the undertaking's outcome. In the end, a force of approximately 2,500 men was established, of whom only 1,000 could said to be experienced soldiers. This force set sail on a fleet comprising 18 warships and 20 transports from Portsmouth in December 1654 and arrived in Barbados a month later, where it spent the next few months recruiting more men from the island and the other nearby English colonies. Many of these men had been transported by the Commonwealth government to the region as indentured servants, as they had fought for the Royalist cause during the Civil War or against Cromwell in Parliament in the other conflicts that surrounded it. In exchange for their service, they were promised freedom from their indentures. You can see on this map of Barbados from the West India Committee collection, men on horseback wearing armour contemporary to the period. The recruitment efforts in the Caribbean resulted in between an extra 3,000 to 4,000 men. This provided the army with six regiments in total, with over a thousand men each, not including the men of the fleet. Although the commanders and commissioners of the expedition had been given some guidance as to which territories they were expected to capture, they were allowed significant discretion in choosing their targets. They decided to first attack Hispaniola, the island which is home to modern-day Haiti and the Dominican Republic, which was at that time the jewel of the Spanish Caribbean. The initial point of the invasion was to be the capital, San Domingo, located on the south coast. The city held special significance for the expedition, as some 80 years previously it had been successfully captured and ransomed back to the Spanish by the great English hero, Sir Francis Drake, on his excursion to the Caribbean. However, the attack went wrong at the outset. The initial plan was to land the army near to the city at the mouth of the River Hainer, but, due to strong surf, this proved impossible. Instead, the army landed to the west, at the mouth of the river Nazau, 25 miles away on the 14th of April 1655. This meant that the army faced a three-day march through jungle terrain to reach the city. The march was perilous and difficult, with no supplies of fresh water available. The men also had their first taste of what would be the greatest threat to European soldiers in the Caribbean, disease. The illnesses they contracted rendered many unfit for service, and in many cases also proved fatal. Among those who fell ill was General Venables, who later recovered. When the army drew near to the city, they were ambushed by a Spanish force who quickly overwhelmed the English. The expedition was only able to escape thanks to the effort of a regiment composed of sailors. Following this failure, another attack was attempted a week later, but was unsuccessful for similar reasons, with the English falling prey to another ambush. Following this, the infantry refused to make another attack and the commanders decided that their purposes might be better met by targeting another Spanish colony. To that end, they departed Hispaniola and proceeded to a nearby yet minor Spanish colony, Jamaica. The attack on Hispaniola through disease, dehydration and Spanish weapons had cost them somewhere in the region of a thousand men. As Jamaica was not as important to the Spanish as some of their other colonies, it was accordingly not as well defended, and as such was a much easier target for the English army. The English fleet arrived at what would later become Kingston Harbour on the 10th of May 1655. The Spanish, concluding that they could not beat the superior English force, abandoned their defences and retreated towards the capital of Santiago de la Vega, modern-day Spanish town, leaving the English free to advance. The Spanish offered to surrender, and the expedition's commanders offered them time to negotiate terms. The Spanish made full use of this time, although not for the reasons that the English intended. Using it as a delaying tactic, they were able to get their most valuable possessions to safety, set free their herds of animals so that they could not be easily captured by the English, and finally set free their slaves, leaving them with the instruction to attack the newcomers which the freedmen did. These freed slaves, joining with other communities of free blacks and the native peoples of the Caribbean, became the Maroon peoples of Jamaica, who would war with the English inhabitants of the island for well over a century. After the Spanish left Jamaica, 
both Robert Venables and William Penn declared that their mission was complete, despite having only captured one minor Spanish colony. Both men set sail for England, separately. However, due to their obvious failures, they were not welcomed as heroes, but instead imprisoned in the Tower of London on a charge of deserting their posts and perceived cowardice. Both men were later released. Whilst the commanders returned home in disgrace, the men who had formed the army instead remained on Jamaica and became the first wave of English settlers, although not willingly in many cases. Many soldiers, as was often the case at the time, brought their wives with them. This had the effect of providing future generations of colonists. Life was hard in that early period. Diseases claimed the lives of many, especially dysentery, known to the men as the bloody flux. The slaves that the Spanish set free chose to follow the last command of their former masters and harassed the English in various attacks, which claimed the lives of many soldiers. Supplies of food were short, and the commissioners who had remained with the army followed orders to preserve Jamaica as much as possible for colonisation by future waves of English settlers. To that end, soldiers were forbidden from foraging on the plantations that the Spanish had left behind for other sources of food, or from shooting cattle that the Spanish had let loose. Before his departure, General Venables had enforced this with a command that men were not to go more than half a mile from their quarters to fetch provisions, on pain of death. A famine soon set in, and many fell prey to malnourishment. The situation was such that it was estimated that of the 7,000 men who had arrived from Hispaniola, from both the army and the navy, over 5,000 of these died during the first 10 months on Jamaica. In order to get more supplies of food, four vessels were dispatched in June 1655 to the nearby Cayman Islands which were well known to European sailors as being an excellent place to catch one of the superfoods of the 17th and 18th centuries, the green turtle. The supplies of this meat were taken back to Jamaica, and it seems probable that later expeditions were also made. This mission may also have resulted in the settlement of another English colony, the Cayman Islands. Tradition holds that two deserters from the English army in Jamaica, men by the name of Watler and Bodden, eventually made their way to the Cayman Islands and became the first permanent settlers, as other Europeans had only visited to secure supplies of turtle, and the native peoples of the Caribbean are currently believed to have never visited the islands. Today there are many people of the Cayman Islands who still bear the surnames of these two men, tracing their descent from the events of the Western design. Although it was successful in capturing Jamaica, and was ultimately responsible for the settlement of the Cayman Islands, it cannot be denied that, compared to its original aims, the Western design was a failure. There are many theories as to why this was the case. The commanders of the expedition blamed the quality of the men that they had to work with, accusing the soldiers of ill-discipline and cowardice. Others argue that the expedition was not equipped with sufficient men or equipment for its gargantuan task. Others point to poor leadership on the part of Penn and Venables, poor relations between these two men, and poor relations between them and the commissioners that were appointed to oversee the expedition. It was also unclear who was in overall command of the expedition, which only served to complicate matters further. In keeping with the religious motivation behind the expedition, many also pointed to God as the source of the mission's failure, ignoring the many other apparent faults. Some pointed to the sinfulness of the soldiers as cause for God to look disfavourably upon the expedition. Others pointed the finger at Oliver Cromwell, accusing him of the sin of pride, or that punishment was due to him for assuming power from Parliament as Lord Protector. Cromwell himself viewed it as being the result of the sins of the entire nation of England. Although largely forgotten today, the Western design had many long-term consequences. Firstly, Jamaica became an English, and later a British, colony for over three centuries, between 1655 and 1962, serving as the heart of the British Caribbean. In Jamaica itself, it also led to the development of the Maroon communities, which can still be found on the island today. They still retain aspects of their martial origins. Although unintended, it also led to the settlement of the Cayman Islands, which remain a British overseas territory. It also marked the first time the English army played a major role in the affairs of the Caribbean, 
and they would continue to do so on many more occasions over the coming centuries. For more information about this topic, as well as the history and heritage of the Caribbean and the work of the West India Committee, please visit us at westindiacommittee.org. Thank you.